you were blessed Sunday morning. Man, power of God fell. What an awesome morning. Uh, just a great day. Praise the Lord for it. How many of you been praying this week? Amen. I was excited to see so many respond in the altar on Sunday morning. Uh, just took time to come down and, and lay that burden, whatever it is, before the Lord. I spoke on prayer. Uh, I'll be preaching on prayer on Sunday mornings for the next several weeks. Uh, I just feel like that's the emphasis God has given me uh, for Sunday mornings for the next few weeks. And this last week was the uh, purpose of prayer. Uh, this week I'll be talking about the power of prayer uh, coming up on, on Sunday morning. Sunday night we'll be dealing with Revelations chapter 14. Uh, if you weren't here this last Sunday night, uh, let me just say, it took me a lot to prepare for that. You should have been here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of information to get together. Uh, but this Sunday night, we're going into chapter 14. And uh, it's, it's, this is all what's, what we're into right now in Revelations. If you haven't been here for this, what we're into right now is an interlude between the sixth trumpet that sounds and the seventh trumpet that sounds. And it's all that's taking place during the last half of the tribulation. After the three and a half, first three and a half years, we're seeing, uh, we'll actually begin to talk a little bit this week about the Battle of Armageddon. We're not really going to get into it real deep because it doesn't come to about chapter 18, 19 down in A.N., but we're, we're in 14, but it, it begins to prelude that. It begins to talk about the wrath of God that's going to fall on those who are not uh, in the Lamb's Book of Life, have their name written down. Um, and so I encourage you, be here Sunday night. Uh, been preparing for that, looking forward to it. Tonight, um, I'm going to talk on a subject for the next uh, 30 minutes or so um, that's different than what we've been doing. How many of you studied for tonight? Well, I guess I just have to teach you something then. <laughs> I didn't give you a book because I told you I wanted to hear from you. And what would you like for us to study? You know, we just finished up uh, Galatians. We've, we've had a great study in, in Romans and Galatians. And, and, you know, and so we kind of took a little break. Somebody mentioned, Pastor, would you talk about fasting? And uh, do you ever do teachings on fasting? I've taught on fasting a number of times over the years, but I'm going to talk about fasting tonight. I, and if I don't finish tonight, we'll do some more next week. Or if you have a, a topic or a subject you would like for us to talk about, let me know, and I'll try to prepare and do that, uh, or we'll go into another Bible study and, and get right back into it. But tonight we're going to talk about fasting, and I want to talk to you about three different types of fasting. There's three different types of fast that I want to refer to. And so I want you to, first of all, turn your Bibles open to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6. And we'll, we'll read verses 16, 17, and 18. This is Jesus, you know, remember in chapter 6, Jesus was asked by his disciples early in the first part of this chapter, he says, Lord, could you teach us how to pray? And so the Lord taught them how to pray in the first part of this. And, and he told them, you know, uh, this is how you should pray. As a matter of fact, I used part of that scripture Sunday morning. And, and talked about that. And then we talked about, you know, when he says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. For, you know, that is a basic synopsis of how we should pray. Okay? You can take that and use it as a guideline for your prayer time. But then he, he begins to talk on fasting down in verse 16. So listen. He says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's pray. Father, tonight, open our eyes, our ears, and our understanding so that we might know you better. Help us to take your word and apply it to our hearts and to our lives. Lord, help us to learn about fasting tonight and God, the purpose of it, and Lord, how we can fast. 
I pray that you will just help us, Lord, to draw closer to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <clears throat> now, tonight, when I read that last part of this scripture, it says here that in that last verse, but only to your praying only, or fasting, you know, so only your Father sees, talk about Heavenly Father, he says, who is unseen, he says, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. For several years, we as a church have done what we call the Daniel fast at the beginning of every year. We did that for several years, and I didn't do it this year on purpose. Some people have, you know, have asked why. I've not had a whole lot, but what happened was, and the reason why I chose not to do it this year as a group, as a, a, a led by a pastor, is it got to a place where people were doing it and talking about it so much, and they were spending so much time in preparation of trying to stay legalistic with the consumption of certain types of foods that it became more of a diet and it spent more time focusing on what we could and could not have rather than spending time praying and fasting. How many of you understand what I'm saying? It got to be more legalistic to that. And, and, and I think about this verse of Scripture, and, and it says, What is done in secret, your Father will reward. So some of you may be already doing a Daniel fast. Praise the Lord. That's good. I'm happy for you. Some of you may be doing another type of fast. That's great. You know, some of you may not be fasting at all. It doesn't mean you're less spiritual, okay? But we'll talk about fasting and the purpose of fasting tonight for just a few moments. You see, fasting is really the third cord in the rope that we have when we want to see spiritual breakthroughs. How many of you know what it is to have a spiritual breakthrough? I mean, you're struggling in life situation. You're going through some difficult times in your life, and, and you're needing God to show up on the scene. You're needing some help to break through an area that has, has defeated you. You're discouraged. You're overcome by stress, worry. Things are just working on you. And so there, there are certain things we can do. Sunday mornings, I'm preaching on prayer. That's the first strand that we'll talk about. We must pray. How many of you know we must pray? You have not because you ask not. If you don't spend in time prayer, don't have time to complain then. Come on. If you haven't prayed, you can't complain. I need to say that again. It just sounds good. If you don't pray, you don't deserve to complain. And if you'll pray, you won't complain because you've already put it in God's hands and your faith is believing God. How many of you believe God for your salvation by faith? If you didn't, you're not saved. It only comes by faith, by accept. So when we pray, we must have faith to believe. It's important to keep that in mind. So prayer is that first strand. The second strand that we don't talk a whole lot about a lot of times, but is the gift of giving. Do you realize that when you give, it opens the floodgates of heaven? And God allows, it allows God to pour back onto you. That's another one of the strands. And the third one is fasting. The fasting is important. We need to keep that in mind. Matter of fact, <clears throat> if you remember in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus had been up on the mountain of transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And they were up there, and their eyes were open. They saw the transformation of, of the Holy Spirit come down, and, and Jesus was transformed into a glorified state, if you will. And he also, they also saw Moses and Elijah, and they were just overwhelmed. Peter, James, and John said, Lord, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to think. Should we build a tabernacle for you? What should we do? And so uh, Jesus said, hey, just keep it yourself. Don't say nothing to nobody. So on the way down, they come down the mountain. He sees a lot of commotion going on. And down at the bottom of the mountain, here's his other disciples, the other nine. They're down there, and they're, they're struggling with the situation because there's a man who has a young boy that has 
an evil spirit. He's going into convulsions. He's flopping around on the ground. He's falling into the fire. The boy, he's done this over and over again. And, and the disciples are there, and the man, the father of the young man says, hey, I've asked your disciples if they could deliver him, and they're not doing a good job. I don't know what we're going to do. And Jesus looks at those nine men, and he says, oh, you of little faith. You rascals, you. Haven't you been with me long enough that just didn't know what to do? And Jesus looked at them, and he looked at the boy, and he prayed over that boy. The boy was instantaneously made whole. The disciples said, well, what's the difference? How come? He says, sometimes these don't come out except by, and this is in verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 21, this kind does not come out except by prayer and what? Fasting. Okay. Now, King James is the only one that really gives us that information. Uh, New King James does as well. A lot of them say it's not really there, but let me just say fasting is important. And fasting is something between you and God. It's not something that you go to your friends and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm fasting over this, you know. Unless you've asked them, look, would you agree with me? I'm struggling with a situation. Would you agree with me? Would you pray? And would you mind fasting at least once a day or a couple days or whatever with me that God will break through this thing? How many of you know there's power in prayer? Amen. There's power in fasting. And, and when two agree is touching any one thing, it shall be done. Fasting is so important. Sometimes we look at it as a last result. It's, it's our last hope. Shouldn't always be that way. But if you've prayed and you've not seen results, it's time to get serious. Three types of fasts I want to present to you tonight, and I'm going to give you a couple examples. The normal fast is the first one. You say, normal? <laughs> yeah, the normal fast. Everybody knows about the normal fast, right? I've given it the name, the normal fast. The normal fast is abstaining from all foods, solids, and liquids, with the exception of water. The normal fast is you're not eating anything. only thing you're doing is you're walking around with a bottle of water or a glass of water because you are fasting and praying, and you're nourishing your body with some fluid, water. How many of you know it's important we've got to have water? Now, there is another fast we'll talk about without water. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. But this here, the normal fast, probably one of the, the best examples that I could give you is probably found in 2 Samuel in chapter 12. You might want to write that down. I'm going to read it to you. It's found here in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And I'm going to start reading in verse 15. How many of you remember uh, the time that that David had decided to stay home instead of go out onto the battlefield. He was spending time out on the balcony when he should have been out on the battlefield. And while he was out there, he happened to look off the balcony, and what did he see? But a beautiful woman who was taking a bath, her name was Bathsheba. And he sent for her, and she came, and he took her, and she conceived in sin. David not only sinned by having a relationship with her out of wedlock, he committed an adulterous affair because she was a married woman. Not only did he do that, but he called the husband back from the battlefield and, and tried to over, you know, tried to get him to go home in hopes that maybe they would have a relation. So if something was happening, he would think that it was his baby instead of her baby. How many of you know Peyton Place? You know, or one of them soap operas. David was right there. He wrote the story there. Okay, and so that didn't work. He said, how can I go home and be with my wife when all the king's men are out there? I got to go do what I got to do. I'm going to sleep here on the steps of the king's palace. I won't go be with my wife. 
So David said, come on, one more night. He, he, tried to, he didn't go home. So finally he sent word with, with him to go back to the battlefield, and he gave the commander this message. He said, send him out into the front lines so that when the fierce battle gets fighting, withdraw from him and leave him there so he'll die. So David became not only an adulterer and a, and a, and a fornicator and, and, and involved in all that, but now he has become a murderer. Whew. We're talking about King David. So the prophet of God comes into David and said, Look, what do you think about a man who, who only has one little lamb? <laughs> Have you heard the story? And he says, and here, this other guy's got all these other sheep and lambs and cattle. And, but he comes and he takes the one that is just a little, like a little child to him. And he offers it at a sacrifice. And yet, he had all that. He said, he ought to die. That ain't right, you know. And he said, the prophet looked at him and says, you the man. You the man. And all of a sudden, the fear fell all over him. He knew he had messed up. Second Samuel twelve fifteen says, The Lord struck that child Uriah's wife had bore to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. Listen to this. He fasted and went into his house and spent nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground but he refused. He would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may go into some, something, de do something desperate. And David Verse 19, David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized that the child was dead. He says, is the child dead, he asked. And yes, they replied, he is dead. Verse 20 says, then David got up from the ground. After he had washed and put on lotions, he changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord, and he worshiped. And then he went to his own house, and then at the request, of, uh, they, they served him food, and he ate. And his servants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David, we know that he sinned. We know that this was a horrible thing in David's life. It wasn't the only time that David had problems, but David had a tender heart before God. And this is what I want you to, I don't want to leave this without saying this. David said, search me, O God. See if there be any wicked way in me. Forgive me. How many of you know David knew about God's forgiveness? David knew that God would forgive him. Not, he didn't do it intentionally knowing that God would forgive him. But here I'm telling you, he went to the Lord and said, Lord, I am sorry. I have failed you. I repent. Church, fasting is a way of submitting to God and humbling ourselves before him. David had already come to the place knowing that he was wrong. He knew the situation he was caught in. When, when the prophet came to him and informed him, you're the man, he knew he had been had. And, and the Holy Spirit used the prophet to speak to him. David fasted. He didn't, he didn't eat anything, although he had a little bit of water. Okay, that's the kind of fast that most of us will do on, on occasions. We'll find ourselves... Fasting, it's not necessarily a prolonged type of fast. Uh, sometimes maybe three days, some maybe one day, maybe, you know, uh, a whole week. It just depends. You know, some of us, let me just say this with, 
with Ulysses, some of us who have now reached an age where we have some health issues have to be very cautious about the fasting. Um, I'm, I'm one that I have to deal with blood sugar. And if I allow my blood sugar to get too low because I haven't taken anything, it can, it can have a, a bad effect on my body. And so I have to really monitor that and watch that. And so if you have issues like that, it's something you have to do in moderation or, or you know, unless the Holy Spirit just gives you clarity and says, you're okay, I'm going to bring you through this thing. If God speaks to you and you feel that's what God said, trust the Lord, okay? Don't take the pastor's word for it. Trust him first, okay? But if it's not the Lord, <laughs> I, I would advise you, be very cautious about prolonged fast, okay? We'll get into some more of those in a minute. Let's look at the second type of fast. The second type of fast is what we call the absolute fast. That was the normal fast. The absolute fast is this. It is abstaining from both food and water. Food and water. It means you're walking around without the bottle of water. It means that you're going without anything for a period of time. Could be a day, could be two, three, a week, longer. Just depends on what you feel God has called you to do and what you and the Lord have prayed about. A story, I won't spend as much time on this one, but coughing. Uh, it's just still that crud. It gets better and then it goes. So I've been fighting it since Christmas. Um, in, in the book of Esther, if you remember uh, Mordecai was down at the gate he showed up one day after a lot of things had happened. I'm not going to go into the whole detail, but he showed up wearing sackcloth and ashes on him. And they came and reported this to Esther, who was already now the queen. They said, hey, your uncle down there, or this man down here, not all of them knew that it was uncle. They said, he's in sackcloth and ashes. And so she sent somebody to find out what was going on. And he told them about the decree that had been placed by the king that all the Jews would be massacred on a certain day in the, in the coming weeks to come. And so he told her, we've got to do something. Go ask the king. Well, she sent word back, says, I can't go to the king unless he calls me in there. And so she says, well, finally, I will go only if you will fast for three days and we'll fast for three days. And it was what we call the absolute fast, no food, no water, nothing. Listen to verse 15 in chapter 4 of Esther. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, nights, or three days, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. And when this is done, then I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. You see, unless the king called for you, you couldn't go into his presence. And if you went into his presence <coughs> and you bowed before him, unless he acknowledged you and extended the scepter, you would be put to death. <coughs> she said she hadn't seen the king in over 30 days. He had not called for her. And, and she was afraid, but I'll do this, but it may mean I die. How many of you know she was put there for such a time as this? That's what the Bible says. And so they fasted, they prayed, and she entered in. The king extended the staff towards her, and he says, What is your request? Up to half of my kingdom I'll give to you, you know. And, and so she began to say, Will you come to a dinner? I won't go to the whole story, but that's, that's the fasting part of that absolute fast. <coughs> In, in Acts chapter 9, another time that absolute fast was there, Paul, who was at the time called Saul, was on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus. He was going after all the Christians at that time, the people which they called the Church of the Way. And he was going after them and persecuting them. And, of course, he has this experience with the Lord on the road to Damascus. And in verses 8 and 9, Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see 
He could see nothing, the Bible says. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. In verse 9, it says, For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. For that three days, he fasted. He waited on God. He was waiting on a man by the name of Ananias to come because the Lord had told him on the road. He said, There will be a man who will come to the place where you're at, and he will lay hands on you, and your eyes will be opened. How many of you know he was serious? God, I need my eyes open. God, I've had a, an experience with you on the road to Damascus here, and I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. How many of you know he never went back after that day? You never hear of Paul giving up or quitting or, or, or ready to throw in the towel. He suffered for the kingdom of God from that day forward. The absolute fast is usually not more than about three days, meaning no food, no water. Now, there were three men, three different occasions, that there were men who fasted for a period of 40 days on the absolute fast. No food, no water, 40 days. This is not recommended for the average Christian. Can I say that again? Three men in the entire Bible that are recorded for 40 days. Now, you may have known somebody that's done this, but usually after a couple of days, your body starts to dehydrate. And after about a week, you're fixing to go. Okay? Your body can't go long without water. But those three men were very or special, not just the regular average kind of guy. The first one was Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, we read the story of Moses going up onto the top of the mountain to get the, the law. And in verse 9, it says, When I went up on the mountain, I received the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord had made with you. I, stay, I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and I drank no water. He was spending time with God. How many of you know it was supernatural? That 40 days was supernatural. The next time we read about this is found in 1 Kings. In 1 Kings chapter 19, the prophet Elijah had just had one of the greatest revivals, one of the greatest experiences of God there had ever been in chapter 18. He was up on Mount Carmel, called fire down from heaven, I mean, the, the altar was consumed, the, the, the sacrifice was consumed, the water that had been put into the trough around it was licked up. I mean, it was a miracle of God. He slayed all the prophets of Baal. He was having a great, ex I mean, great, let me just say, when great things happen, get ready, because the devil ain't happy. Just after you have one of the greatest experiences in your life, get ready because the devil's coming after you. And that's exactly what happened on that day of Elijah. He found out that uh, uh, the king's wife, old Jezebel, was out to get him. Oh, she was, she was in, a, in, a, in a stampede of snot and, boy, I'm telling you, she was coming. She was fired up. She was going to have his head on a platter. Let me tell you, she had had all she could take of him. And so Elijah, the man of power, man of faith, great man of God, all of a sudden got scared of this woman who had her, paint, her face all painted up. And he said, whoa, I'm leaving here. And he runs for his life in chapter 19. <coughs> he's running, 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 and he finds himself. He's asleep on the ground, and God comes to him. He's laying underneath this tree. And the Lord wakes him up and said, what are you doing, Elijah? What are you doing? And in verse 7 in chapter 19, the angel of the Lord came to him a second time, and he touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, and he ate, and he drank. He strengthened by the food, and then, listen to this, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into the cave and spent the night. During those 40 days and 40 nights, he had to depend on that last meal that he had had. He had nothing from that time. Now, this is a man who had had ravens come and bring him food. 
This is the man who had the widow prepare a little bread for him. Come on. But God said, get ready, because God was, his time was coming to the end. He had served God well, but his ministry was just about over. And he goes up into the cleft. I won't preach the whole story here. <laughs> but he goes up into the cleft of that rock, and he's sitting there, and, and he says, you see that wind? You see that storm? You see this? You see that? Do you hear? He said, God wasn't in the wind. God wasn't in the storm. God wasn't in this. But it was that still, small voice. How many of you know, sometimes we want to see God in the big action, but God sometimes comes to us with that still, small voice in the quietness of our resting in his presence. Let me tell you what, if you don't ever turn the radio off, if you don't ever find yourself a place to get quiet with God, how in the world are you ever going to hear from him? I like to be able to sit down and read my Bible and then close it and just let the Holy Spirit talk to me for a while. Anybody hear me? Oftentimes, when I'm reading, the Holy Spirit begins to jump off the pages at me. The Word of God begins to speak to my heart, and, and new life begins to fill me in freshness from the Word of God. Church, if you're not in the Word, you're not getting anything. Amen? Well, I'm going to tell you this last one, then I'll, I'll save one for next week. How's that? Because it's almost 8 o'clock. Um, the third person, you ought to know him well. His name is Jesus. Jesus, after being baptized, Holy Spirit descended down on him like the dove, remember? Clouds roll back, the voice comes out from heaven, says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Bible says he come up out of there, and then he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted for a period of 40 days. During that 40 days, in Matthew chapter 4, reading verse 1, then Jesus was led by the Spirit in the desert to be tempted by the devil. How many of you know that was a part of God's plan? He had to do that. He had to be tempted by the devil to show that he could conquer the devil. Can I hear amen? amen. He said, because I've already defeated him, you don't have to worry about it. Amen? amen? He'll fight your battles for you if you let him. Anyhow, he says, to be tempted by the devil, and after 40 days and 40 nights... He wasn't hungry anymore. Now my Bible says he was hungry. I, I, I guess I would be pretty hungry after about 40 days or 40 nights. I'd be hungry about after four hours. Anybody with me? Let's be honest. But when you're fasting, and we'll talk about this more next week, when you're fasting, you're making your body submit to you. You're making your body do something. You see, a lot of times our body tells us what it wants. And we respond to what our body wants. But this is a way of taking mastery over our body is through fasting. We say, body, you can't have that. You're going to hold back. I'm going to suffer for Jesus a little bit here. I'm going to spend that time with God and pray. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Jesus spent that time with the Lord. It says in verse 3, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. Jesus said, The Word of God says, Come on, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Church, when you're doing warfare with the devil, don't tell him what Pastor Arley said. Don't tell him what your Sunday school teacher said. Don't tell him what you heard the TV evangelist say. You tell him, the Word of God says this. Tell him exactly what the Word says. And when you speak the word, the devil, he has to resist, you resisted him. The Bible says if we resist the devil, he will flee. He will go. The devil left Jesus for a little bit, but he came back, the Bible says, 
And he was tempted in all ways like we are tempted, but yet he did not sin. Can I hear it? Amen. amen. I'll tell you the third type of fasting, and we'll get into it next week, but it's the partial fast, also known as the Daniel fast. We'll, we'll do a little more explaining on that next week. If you would like to take one of these, I ran these off today. And we gave these out before in, in times past, but it's on the Daniel fast. It talks a little bit about it. But we'll go into detail next week on the, uh, the third type of fasting and, and several other things that I have for you. Amen. Do you love the Lord? Any, any quick questions? Stand with me then. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Glad you were here tonight. <coughs> Lord, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word. God, I pray that tonight, you have spoke to our hearts, Lord, and we know that through fasting and through prayer, God, things can be changed. Lord, I pray that you will speak to the hearts of those that are here tonight. Lord, we, we prayed Sunday, and Lord, we talked about things, and we knew that, Lord, one of the key ways to, to getting things done in our life and seeing changes is to spend time in prayer. But God, another aspect of seeing change is not only prayer, but it's also fasting. So, Lord, I pray that you will speak to the hearts of these people that are struggling, Lord, that are going through difficult times, that, Lord, even if they fast one meal a day, or if it be just one day, or two, or three, whatever it may be that they choose to go with, God, I pray that you will help them to see victory in their situations. Lord, we thank you for it. Go with us now, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.